Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining the session today on protecting our planet through technology. I'm Ellie Sargent, and I work for a Guildford-based satellite manufacturer called Surrey Satellites. Um, on the panel today, we've got Gavin Broad, who's a, the principal curator in charge of insects at the Natural History Museum. We've got Christina Novales, who's a Jasmine Technical Administrator at the Science and Technology Facilities Council. And then Dr. Alan Schapp, who is the Associate Head of the Ocean Technology and Engineering Group at the National Oceanography Centre. Um, so we'll start the session by going around the panel um, and giving you all a summary of our roles, um, potentially how we came up to be where we are, and then also um, how our organisations are protecting our planet um, are going forward. Then after the introductions, as with the other sessions, we'll break out into a live Q&A session where you can ask us various questions um, on our jobs, how we got there, you know, you name it, in our industries. Um, so I'll kick things off, um, just to give you a quick background of how I got to where I am. So um, I, I'm going to take you all the way back to when I was at school. I had no idea what I wanted to go into, um, no idea where I wanted to end up. Um, and it seemed really mad at the time during secondary school to choose where I wanted to go. So I basically just chose things that were fun to me. And luckily, um, I ended up where I am. So I went down the, the kind of maths and science route. But I also chose things like art and uh, food technology. Um, more excuses to eat cake. But um, I broadened basically my horizons at GCSE and then find out, found out what I wanted to do um, as I progressed through GCSEs and A-levels and then whittled it down uh, to where I was choosing my master's, which was space science um, at UCL, University College London. Um, the choice I made were purely based on what I enjoyed most. And I'd say that as a kind of heads up to you guys, if you're struggling working out what you want to do, just choose what you love. Um, and it's, it's definitely the best policy. Um, so I ended up working for Sorry Satellites after my master's. And the way I kind of got into it was just by being a bit proactive um, and getting some work experience. If you don't know what you want to go into, definitely try work experience. I always think it's easier to find out what you don't want as opposed to what you do want. Um, and just getting experience is a good way of doing that. So I got work experience at SSTL and ended up here, which is fantastic. Because I currently work in the clean rooms, which is a pressurised, very clean AIT hall. It's just in front of me. Um, and that's where we manufacture, assemble and test all of our spacecraft. So this is satellites that orbit, get launched up on a rocket, and then they orbit the Earth's, um, around the Earth, um, at low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and high, high inclinations as well. Um, so I'm really thankful to be where I am today. Um, and what I wanted to go through about my role and what I do is the missions that we're currently working on. So one mission I'm working on at the moment, um, I'm the AIT lead for, so I'm in charge of integration testing that spacecraft. Um, and it's a mission called Satellite View uh, for a customer called Satellite View. And that company is aiming to become the world's thermometer by monitoring the world through um, medium wave infrared imagery. Um, and before I go any further, I'm just going to share my screen and play through a little video for you so you can uh, get an idea of this mission and what it's going to be when it launches. So this dark arm is the specific imager that we are integrating on Satellite View spacecraft. So I'm just going to go ahead and press play and talk you through um, what it is. So it's a medium wave infrared imager um, and it because it's medium wave infrared, it's basically the, the world's thermometer. So it can detect things like heat seepages from, from, from land masses, from, um, from buildings. And what that intends to do is one of the problems we've got with, um, with moving forward with, with climate protection is to optimize the way we currently live. Um, and the best way to, to minimize our impact on the environment is to, to make sure our, um, our footprints are as efficient as possible. Um, so things like uh, insulation, um, uh, how, we, how we set up facilities, any of the outgassing that we have from facilities, this is going to be monitoring that and making sure that what we're doing, um, what we implement is actually affecting the, the thermal emissions from uh, different sites. So you can see here on this video, um, this is, I'm just going to move that, sorry. Um, this is the AIT clean room. So I'm just going to pause it there. This is one of the electronic units that we've got on the spacecraft. This is the front end electronics. And you can see these faces down here. These are filters that we move in front of the detector uh, to view 
um, to view through, through, the, through, the, through the camera. Um, so at the moment they're testing on the bench and this is, this is the current setup. So um, we're going through manufacture at the moment. We've got all the modules coming into the end of this year, coming to AIT, which is me, down in the clean room. And I'm going to be assembling those, uh, building up the spacecraft, which is what this looks like here. So it's got two deployable panels, you can see, and that's solar panels. So you get all the power from the sun um, and it's going to be launched the beginning of next year. So stay tuned with that one. Um, the next mission I wanted to talk to you about is something very exciting um, called Hydrogen SS. And I'll try and be quick because I know I'm slightly running out of time. Um, but it's a, a mission that basically uses GPS signals. So global navigational satellite systems signals. So things like, you know, things that, that give you a, a positioning uh, location with things like phones, cars, um, and, and even aeroplanes. We basically use those signals um, and pick them up from, from when they get reflected off the earth and we can form imagery um, that helps us basically understand water content of various land use uses. So things like soil moisture content, um, how much biomass there is in a forest, which then feeds into things like um, the biodiversity. Um, we also use it to monitor wetlands um, for things like uh, you know, how much methane we expect those wetlands to give off and how much water content there is coming into an area. If it isn't a wetland, then obviously it's more likely to flood. So it's protecting ourselves and also understanding, you know, the, the world in which we're living. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again and show you just a quick video of that mission. This one's a little bit more fun, um, I promise. So it's got a nice simulation of the actual spacecraft and what it's going to look like. So share my screen. I think you guys can see that. I'm just going to double click on this one. Um, so this is once it's launched, this is our spacecraft. This is Hydro GNSS. Hydro obviously water-based. GNSS is the global navigational satellite systems. So that's the that's the things it's detecting uh, the reflected signals. This is the spacecraft here. Um, so it's got four deployable panels. This on the right hand side, on the left hand side, that's one of the GNSS satellites. So it's much higher up in orbit than the spacecraft that we're launching. And you can see here, you've got data coming down to the uh, to the Earth and getting reflected back to our spacecraft. So this is actually, it's what we call kind of like a passive detection. We're not transmitting any of those signals. We're just detecting those that get bounced back off the Earth. Um, and the cool thing about this is there are so many satellites in these constellations of GNSS. So we get a lot of signals being reflected, a lot of data, and we get, um, because we're in low Earth orbit, so we're quite close to the Earth when we're orbiting our spacecraft, we get quite a, a big turnaround in terms of data. So I think it's three days that we can cover the whole, um, the whole Earth's uh, surface uh, and get data for across the globe. And I think in a minute, it's just going to show you uh, where that is. So like I said earlier, biomass, permafrost, um, various things that we can monitor with this satellite. Just to note, this is funded by ESA, which is a European Space Agency uh, funded mission. Um, and one of the core cool things that they're trying to do now is go to something that's a little bit, you know, a kind of cheaper, quick turnaround, which is why they're coming to industries like mine, um, where we can make things quite fast um, and get them launched in a couple of years. So this is just showing you the coverage over the world um, within the days. So global coverage every 15 days, sorry. But that's complete coverage, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and that will go back down to, to teams on the ground to assess the data um, and, and make informed decisions about how we manage various land uses. So um, I hope that's a good overview of what I do. Um, I'm now going to pass over to, to Gavin. Um, who's uh, thankfully joined us. Um, Gavin, over to you, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, all right, my work is a little bit more earthbound, but I, I work on at the Natural History Museum, mainly on insects, but I'm gonna talk about my involvement in a project called Darwin Tree of Life, uh, which is a little bit more high tech than what I have been doing in the past. Um, hopefully you can see that slide. It was just, oh, no, no. Oh, that was supposed to be, <laughs> hopefully you can see that slide, which explains a little bit. Darwin Tree of Life is a genomics project. So essentially this is um, going out and collecting 
organisms, that's animals, plants, fungi, and of course, um, single celled organisms that we call protists, all that kind of, all that amazing sort of diversity of life. And we're concentrating in the UK, and we're going out and collecting these, uh, these specimens and sequencing their DNA, which in itself doesn't sound particularly difficult, but what we're trying to do is then assemble that DNA into the entire genome of an individual. So that's how all that DNA is packaged up into chromosomes and where on those chromosomes the genes are that encode the proteins that enable this, these organisms to, to exist. Um, you know, this, this genome encodes an organism's uh, evolutionary history and all its adaptations to life in this complex world. So this is quite an ambitious project. It's part of a, uh, an even larger global project called the Earth Biogenome Project. And what this, and the technology aspect here comes from uh, the fact that this is riding off the back of the Human Genome Project. You know, you'll all have heard of the Human Genome Project, deciphering our DNA and how our genome is, um, is arranged into chromosomes and where all the genes are. And that was a huge effort costing somewhere over $3 billion. Um, but, you know, and that would basically sort of enable, that was really a, a pioneering project that enabled us to do this uh, at scale for other organisms. Once we'd worked out how to do it for humans, we, you know, a bunch of people thought we could do that for life on this planet. You know, the Human Genome Project, uh, it was pretty expensive, uh, but that ended up, uh, you know, directly benefiting economies to the tune of about a trillion dollars, it's been estimated. So that was um, a relatively small investment for a huge return. Knowing how our genomes are arranged has enabled huge breakthroughs in medicine and um, and other technologies. So there you go. So what do we do? So my example of um, so Darwin Tree of Life, we're going out there collecting all sorts of different organisms, like I said. I'm really interested in wasps. So here's a lovely little wasp, uh, which has had its genome sequenced. Uh, this has been collected in a wood in Oxfordshire. Uh, that gorgeous little black and yellow thing, not everybody's favorite organism, but I do have a real soft spot for wasps. So that particular specimen was frozen on dry ice. Um, it's, we've been tracking it through barcodes, through scanners, uh, as, the, as, the, as the specimens made its way through systems. It's been kept at really low temperatures, including, uh, so we have a, a lovely molecular collections facility here with dry liquid nitrogen and all that kind of stuff. And we've got some amazing plots here, which basically show you how its DNA has been sequenced and then it's been sequenced in great big long chunks. That's why we keep it really cold. So you've got a huge long chunk of DNA, which you can pour, you, which you almost literally pull through a little pore in a film it reads off all the DNA, the base pairs of the DNA, the A's, the C's, the G's, and the T's. This little wasp, it read about 315 million base pairs. And it did that in chunks of about 20 million base pairs, which were then stitched together. Um, and you can see some uh, plots there that show some really fancy uh, maths and bioinformatics that assembles all that DNA into the likely chromosomes. And that, that plot with all the weird squares shows you roughly the quality of the chromosome uh, coverage for DNA. You don't need to know the details, but the basic point is we get an awful lot of data on how the DNA is arranged in this rather obscure WASP, and then where we can find 12,000 different genes encoding for all sorts of different proteins. Um, so that's the high-tech end of it. Uh, it's also quite a low-tech project in that we go out with nets into uh, lovely bits of the countryside and try and collect organisms using the amazing knowledge of, of uh, you know, people who understand these beasts. Uh, I've got a row of books behind me. That's the sort of low-tech end of basic knowledge of organisms, what they do, where to find them. We're then going through to the really high-tech end of getting a genome out, and that, we hope, will introduce a whole new level of releasing genetic data out there and all this genetic data can be really useful in sort of um in human applications in um you know sort of amazing examples such as uh, potentially some really useful cancer drugs that have come out of um uh, particular chemicals produced by sponges you know there's um an awful lot of um, work going on in relatives of crops to see whether they have the potential to be crop foods you know basically there's a lot of in really useful information that comes out of genomes that can help us as society, as a species. But we also hope to use these genomes to help organisms. Uh, we want to understand how they're responding to change in the environment, particularly climate change. We hope to be able to use these genomes to understand 
how genetically diverse they are at the moment and go back in time, essentially, I'm working in a museum. One of the interesting applications is that we can use museum collections as a time capsule. We can use this genomes from the fresh, uh, from the freshly collected specimens to go back. We've got, we've got a lovely genome now of this particular wasp, say, and we know where the genes are. We can go back to the collections here where things, specimens have been sitting for upwards of 200 years and their DNA is all fragmented, but we can go back and we can stitch those little bits of DNA to this sort of scaffold and understand how the genetics of these organisms have changed over the last two centuries. So understanding how our impact in the world uh, is how our changes to the world is impacting on other species. And that's probably, and just to point out, Darwin Tree of Life, although I work at the Natural History Museum, I'm one, this is one of about 10 partner organizations that are making this happen with funding from the Wellcome Institute, uh, quite a lot of funding. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting collaborative project. One of the joys of, of science really is to, is to collaborate with people um, with very diverse sets of skills. So that, yeah, that's a quick, um, yeah, that's a quick summary of where I am, uh, of, of the Darwin Tree of Life. And uh, is, that, is that about on time? Yeah. And that's perfect. Thanks, Kevin. That was really yeah. fascinating to hear about your genome sequencing. Um, we'll now pass over to Christia, Christina um, at the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Hello, everyone. Um, let me get some uh, slides here and share with you. Here we go. So um, I am a Linux system administrator at the Science and Technologies Facilities Council, uh, it's called STFC. Uh, so to tell you a bit about my background, uh, I always, always loved computers and pretty much technical things. So um, I'm programming a lot as well. So I studied computing and intelligence systems at Oxford Brookes University. Um, and then after I finished university, I started directly in STFC, uh, working as a graduate in 2007. Uh, first, I started as a software developer. I was writing code. And then I moved to be a um, system administrator. So STFC um, is part of the UK research and innovation public body. And it, it has many facilities all over the country. Um, and also some outside the country. Uh, so I work at the Rutherford Apple, Appleton Laboratory um, in Oxfordshire, in the scientific computing department. So we have many, many facilities here on, on site. Uh, we have things like the central laser facility, where they do research with little lasers and big lasers. Uh, we have the RAL space department, which I collaborate directly uh, through the project I'm in. Uh, we have some accelerators, uh, which you might have heard of Diamond Light Source and ISIS. Um, so the main project I work on is called Jasmine. And I think you, if you were in the previous session, uh, Jack is one of my colleagues, you might have heard something about it. Um, so Jasmine is funded by the uh, Natural Environment Research Council. And so it provides uh, its facilities, it provides them for environmental data research. So examples of things we have in Jasmine is maybe satellite uh, radar data that monitors every volcano on earth. Well, we also have things like uh, uh, wildlife data that is observed by volunteers and then is stored in our system. And because we also hold climate data, uh, the scientists can use to put together those sets of data and then hopefully uh, understand the decline of UK's wildlife and use this information for creating policies or conservation work. Um, so what we do in Jasmine is the computing infrastructure and we have loads and loads of compute uh, data storage. Um, so we're talking about over 50 petabytes of uh, data, which I know it's a bit difficult to visualize, uh, but uh, if you were to take 4,000 photos a day for the next 50 years, you will still not get close to one petabyte. So, so a lot more than that. Um, and when you, as a scientist, you need to use that data, if you need to move it up and down, download it, upload it, uh, it's very, very time consuming. Um, uh, so what we have is also a lot of, uh, processing computers that where they can uh, run uh, simulations or models uh, or analyze this data. And they do this all in one place. Uh, we also have some cloud uh, on site that we provide for the scientists so they can have their own services or, or, or run their own software. So I am part of the team that takes care of all this computing. Um, so we buy, we install the 
the, the systems, uh, we configure them, we also lay cables uh, for networking uh, and take care of the operating system as well and provide support for the developers and the users of the system. Um, so my day-to-day -day work is varies a lot, let's say. Um, so a lot of the time I'm sitting at my desk, I'm writing some code, I'm investigating new technologies, finding better ways to, to, to improve systems and so on. Uh, but also I can be in the machine room a lot of times, um, which I am next to it right now. Um, and I can be moving kit around, uh, laying cables under the floor, as you can see so there in some of the pictures trying to find problems or so on. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was to show you the data center. I thought it might be interested. I don't know if many of you will have seen a data center. Uh, but it's impossible to do it live because it's really, really noisy. It's not a very easy environment to talk in. So we've done a little video and I'm gonna see if I can walk you through it. Let's see. So here we go. So this is the operations room where I'm sitting right now. And now we're getting out into our low, lower power density, low power density room, okay? So this is for, uh, for the machines that use less power and less heat. And this here is the tape robot. So this is a way of storing a lot of data, which is a lot cheaper than just using computers. Um, so, so those are tapes that the robot can go and grab. Um, and that robot contains thousands of tapes and each of them can be up to 20 terabytes. Uh, so one of those robots can have a hundred petabytes of data. And the tapes are cheaper, they last longer uh, and they don't need any power to run. Um, so this is, the this is the high power density room. And this is where the big machines are. And these are enclosed aisles. Uh, and this, the reason for this is the air conditioning. So the cold there needed to cool down the computers, come down from the floor, and then goes through the computers, cooling them down, and then comes out to the other side, uh, hotter, obviously. And we can have you know, a certain amount of computers in each of those cabinets called racks. Um, it depends on the power they use and the heat they produce. That's the limit. This is the hot aisle. This is very, very hot here, all the computers throwing out hot air. And we're gonna look at this uh, here. And this is the networking rack. So each of those blue cables that connect computers together, each of those is 100 gigabit per second. So if you compare that to a home broadband, like could be a good home broadband, could be 50 megabit per second, you would need 2000 home broadbands to, to, to just be the equivalent of one of those little cables. And we have loads of those. This is another way of storing data. This is a, a storage system. Um, and each of those vertical things that you can see there with the flashy lights, that's a computer in itself. And one of those racks can have 2.5 petabyte, petabyte of data, which you now know is a lot. <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, this on the left. These are the water cool racks we have, uh, which instead of having air uh, coming directly, they have water that goes into those pipes into the door of the rack, and then there's a mesh, and then there's fans that blow the air from here into the rack, cooling the, cooling the systems. Um, so this was a very, very, oops, sorry. Um, let's see if I can uh, pass the, uh, sorry, it had to happen. Let's see if we finish again. Here we go, sorry. So it was a very, very quick uh, sort of trip around our machine room, which is one of the coolest things we do. Um, there are some links here. Um, we have an online tour of the machine room, uh, which you can go like Google Maps style and walk through it and see some uh, in interesting facts about it. And if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a fantastic tour of the facility. Um, we'll now, okay, we'll now go over to um, Alison at the National Oceanography Centre. Hi, everybody. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Great, thanks. And hopefully you can see some slides too. So uh, as Ellie mentioned, uh, I work at the National Oceanography Centre. I just thought I'd explain my background a little bit. I grew up in Canada, hence the accent. 
Um, and I found in high school that I really enjoyed physics. So I went and did uh, engineering in university. And while I was at university, I got a part-time job, um, not as some grand career plan, but just to help pay the bills, working in a research lab that was doing environmental studies. And it started off with a lot of washing dishes and doing the infantry. Um, but after a few years, I got involved in some research projects and found I really liked it. So after that, I went and did a PhD in engineering in the Netherlands. And after I finished that, I moved here to the UK. Uh, and I work here at the National Oceanography Centre, where the rest of this day has been hosted. Um, that's a view of our, our facility from a ship. And as you can guess, um, we do a lot of research around the oceans, so it's directly related to protecting our planet. But where engineering comes into this and technology is that I work in a big team, you can see us there, of engineers and scientists, and we invent new machines that can help us study the ocean. So when a scientist needs to measure, let's say maybe the concentration of a chemical, or they wanna see what kind of algae are living in the ocean, and there's no machine out there that can do it, they come to us and we invent a new machine for them that can measure the things that they want to measure. And what is really cool about this is that you get to learn about the problems that scientists are trying to study. You get to make new technology to help them solve it, but we also get to go out into the ocean and help the scientists use it um, because they need to be trained, they need some, some help with new machines. Uh, so I get to go out on ships, usually for about a month, a year. Um, you can see a few pictures here from working in the North Sea. This is 100 meters below water. There's some fancy underwater robots collecting and returning equipment up to the top of the sea surface here. And the coolest place I got to go for my work was actually to Antarctica last year. So you can see a big giant iceberg that we're sailing next to on the video there on the left. And I was part of a team that was trying to study how climate change is affecting the seas around Antarctica. But in order to do those studies, they needed new kinds of sensors that could measure things that nothing else could measure. So we've invented some sensors for them, went along, helped them put them in the sea, and left them there for a whole year so they could study climate throughout the entire course of a whole year of seasons. So it was a really neat opportunity to study um, some really unusual water um, around Antarctica with an engineering degree. It's not really what you expect. So the last thing, just what I like about this job, I like that I get to use my engineering skills to help protect the planet by working together with scientists who are studying the oceans. I like that I get to go travel and see different parts of the UK and the world, either on ships or like this in local rivers. And that I get to work with a really passionate and creative team who care about using their skills to protect the planet and work on uh, understanding our environment. So that's it for me. I think we've got a few minutes left for some questions and answers, which Ellie's going to be passing around to us. Thanks, Alison. That was fantastic. Um, so we do have a few questions. The first one I'm going to ask to Gavin. Um, so we've got a question from Arc School, which is what happens if a new species is discovered midway through gathering samples? Uh, well, that's a great question. One of the things we really hope for with this project, actually, uh, the Earth Biogenome Project, is that it will enable us to discover more species, um, possibly hidden species, as in we sequence them and realise that there are huge differences between populations, but also help with the, just the process of species description, you know, going out there and collecting and finding new things. Um, we've got some new fungi and some new wasps in the pipeline, so we've collected these. <clears throat> with a fungus, it's relatively easy. You can still have the rest of the specimen. You take part of it off and sequence all the DNA, and the rest of it is there as a voucher. When I found a new species of wasp, it's more a case of I'm not going to submit that for genome sequencing at the moment because it'll get ground up into dust. Um, so I try and collect another one, uh, which is I've done. I've gone back to Northwest Scotland and found some more specimens. So hopefully we can publish a, a description of a new species from Scotland, along with its entire genome, which would be really exciting. It's, you know, we're, just, we're describing it in the, most, in the fullest way possible. That was lovely. Thank you. Cheers, Gavin. Um, one question for Christina. What temperature do the PCs and drives get to and what temperatures do you try and maintain them at? Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> um, it's a very good question. I I don't remember the exact numbers, and I should probably do this. I know that we try to keep them as hot as possible because obviously this helps um, use reduce the use of uh, power and, and cooling. Um, I do know that uh, uh, we sort of put the air at like 21 degrees, um, more or less. Um, we can see that the racks behind at the moment, the, behind the racks, the hot racks, it's something like 30 something degrees, but obviously inside the computers, they will be, they will be hotter. 
but yeah, behind around 30-ish degrees. Nice and cool. <laughs> and uh, last couple of questions, I've got one for Alison. Um, what is the most exciting uh, unit that you worked on or module that you worked on? I think my favorite technology so far has been stuff to measure ocean acidification because it's happening all over the planet. Um, and it's happening differently in different places, depending on what lives where, and different things are susceptible to ocean acidification in different ways. So by having lots of different sensors, we can really study how this is changing in different areas, how different life is affected by that. And that's been really exciting to see. Fantastic, thank you. And last one, just for Gavin, can you bring back extinct animals? Um, personally, no. Um, I would also argue, yeah, this is, there's a lot of debate about this at the moment. Theoretically, people are arguing maybe you can. I suggest it's, it's a bit of a red herring. And what are we actually bringing back? We're probably not bringing back what we've actually lost. We're bringing back some kind of substitute. Maybe we should concentrate on preserving what we have. Yeah. That would be my response. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for the questions and answers. Um, it's been wonderful having this discussion um, and providing a fascinating insight into everyone's industries. The next session will be protecting our planet through engineering and it will start very soon on the same link that we're currently on. Uh, so thanks again to all the panelists, uh, Gavin, Gavin, Christina and Alison. Um, it's been a pleasure. So thank you again and goodbye.